My name is Chloe Marie Mora. And my name is Eric Padilla. And for our midterm project, we did the one lunger steam engine. So essentially, this is a simple model engine of a uh, one piston, four stroke steam engine. And this was created in the 60s. And so it's a pretty uh, basic design. Uh, the purpose of this project was to test our uh, abilities from a previous um, engineering CAD uh, course and pick up uh, and apply the new lessons we learned uh, this semester so far. Uh, we were given two sheets of dimensioned drawings for each of the parts involved in this schematic. And uh, a lot of these were uh, dimensioned appropriately, um, as we'll kind of go into later. There were some inconsistencies and some misleading uh, representations, both visual and uh, quantitative, about these sheets. But um, we used our best engineering judgment and were able to easily overcome these challenges and make a full assembly that uh, fit together on the first try. There were four sub-assemblies created to maximize the efficiency of the overall assembly. Uh, the sub-assemblies were divided with help from the original part drawings shown in the previous slide. For example, the crank plate um, was presented as a single part, but we, because it has actually so many small parts, we created a sub-assembly for that single part. Um, but the other sub-assemblies were created based on kind of the natural flow of the engine design itself. And we actually uh, left all of the smaller parts that um, were the, the sort of the main moving parts, um, we just saved for the main assembly since those were most easily uh, constrained under uh, separate sets of constraints. And uh, if you are familiar with CAD or um, any sort of CAD program, you can usually group these constraints by their uh, locations and functions. And so that's what we did. As far as the materials used for the engine, um, we were not provided any materials, but we were able to kind of take a look. For example, here it's obvious that this is made out of wood. Um, for the remaining parts, we uh, did a little bit of research in order to determine that certain parts would be better used made out of steel, iron, brushed metal, or chroma, as well as a couple of rubber parts. The workload of the project was divided um, such that everyone would have the opportunity to work on every aspect of the project, but overall the uh, responsibilities would be divided based on everyone's individual skill. So for myself, I created the base plate, the crank pin spacer, the eccentric, the valve, the valve pin, the flywheel, and the piston con rod. Um, and I was responsible for the majority of the paper, um, just compiling everything, um, compiling the parts, sub-assemblies, and assembly drawings as well. And for me, like she said, uh, we kind of just split up the parts to uh, better suit each uh, to other's skills, and then also um, what we thought was representative of equal amount of uh, time into the project. So um, I did a few more parts, but I spent less time on the actual report, and um, just I put together the slides at the end. Um, based on what was done with the report and the sub-assemblies. So uh, I did uh, these parts here, um, making up uh, sort of the, the bulk of the structure, um, and I was kind of building the, ass the assembly as we went on, and uh, we kind of just got together and uh, collaborated as we were building parts throughout the semester. We did come across a few challenges um, throughout the course of completing this project. Um, one big problem that we didn't anticipate was our time constraint. While we knew that this would be a time consuming project, we definitely underestimated um, the amount of time, not necessarily the difficulty, but just the actual time it would take uh, to dimension all the parts and, and little details like that. Um, additionally, as Eric mentioned earlier, there were issues in the uh, 
materials provided as far as certain constraints and information that we were missing. Um, but other than that, there were no issues completing this project. Um, overall, we divided the part and the assembly design as well as the drawings. Um, we were able to apply not just stuff that we've learned in this class so far, but stuff that we learned in our very first Katia class, EGR 120, which was great to reinforce everything that we've learned so far, as well as to teach us a few extra tricks as well. Oh, I said as well twice. What else? Um, I don't know. We <clears throat> used our best engineering judgment to successfully complete yeah, the project. Yeah, just stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Chloe did everything. <laughs> Eric's going to um, piggyback off of my coattails like usual. Yeah, whatever. Eric. All right. So one of the first sub-assemblies we were doing was just a base plate. We wanted to get a, a solid foundation, that something that we wouldn't have to uh, move around and we can anchor in the overall assembly. And so we went ahead and did that with the uh, wooden plate, the metal base plate, and then the three wooden uh, screws that uh, held the the two parts together and so we constrained those and anchored them first that way we would have a sort of uh, locked reference for um, all of our other parts to be constrained to and uh, it worked perfectly everything fit and we were pretty happy with the results as I mentioned earlier this subassembly was provided as a single part um, but as you can see, it's actually made up of five different parts. So we went ahead and made a subassembly for it so we wouldn't have to worry about all those individual parts kind of flying around. This subassembly was particularly easy as three of the five parts were just pins. The next subassembly was just the bulk of the crankshaft, and this consisted of a primary rod and uh, the pinwheel, which was a simple shaft command and a profile sketch. Uh, nothing really too complicated there. Uh, we added the holes after we shafted this command. And these are two uh, of the biggest parts of this assembly and they're held together by this sort of push pin. Uh, so you can see here in the final assembled view, um, they're just held together by um, contact and uh, friction. Uh, the other piece was called the eccentric. This is uh, rotated with the rod and the pinwheel, but it operated the valve, which um, produced the uh, outgas of the uh, steam going into the upper chamber of the uh, one lunger. And uh, this is a sub-assembly in and of itself. There's actually one part we saw in the previous uh, um, slide. So this is sub-assembly two of that sort of cranked uh, disc. And the final piece is this uh, crank pin right here. And this is what's used by the piston assembly to rotate the entire uh, crankshaft. So it, pro it provides the mechanical power from the steam to the rotating pinwheel at the very end right here. The final subassembly is the bearing subassembly. Um, this is the subassembly that contains a couple of rubber parts, which are these plugs right here on either side. Um, the bearing itself kind of acts as a stabilizer. This essentially holds the crankshaft in place. So when we have the steam coming in, rotating our parts and our piston, uh, the valve will uh, rotate along with this uh, crankshaft, which will be within uh, the constraint of this uh, bearing holder right here. Um, just a simple coincidence constraint, nothing too complicated. Again, um, these are all pretty simple designs. Uh, the parts didn't take very long to make or assemble or constrain. Uh, I think um, this was probably one of the easiest um, parts of the entire assembly. To wrap up this enchilada. Here's the two pictures of the exploded view and the fully assembled view of all of our uh, assemblies and parts. Um, this is uh, the bearing holder that we just mentioned, the crank plate, and then the crank shaft assembly, and then of course our base assembly here. Uh, the rest were just an assembly, uh, or sorry, an assortment of the screws that held everything together. And then, of course, our valve here, our, I'm sorry, our valve here, our piston here. And here's our intake for the steam. And that outtake would be that valve right there. So 
some of the most difficult parts um, I might say were these uh, support bearings uh, for the top casing here. Um, the only reason that was the case was the dimension drawings that we were given were not particularly helpful. Um, they were actually a unfolded sheet metal design, which is not commonly used, uh, or at least in our experience, we had never really encountered it. And so we were, we were uh, looking at different auxiliary views that weren't matching up, and we were very confused as to why uh, we were having uh, inconsistencies with the dimensions given. But it turns out that it was uh, pretty uh, easy to just uh, intuitively look at it and figure out using you know some difference in sym symmetries to find the proper dimensions. In the end, uh, when we fully assembled this, uh, everything fit together perfectly the very first time. It was uh, very nice and easy to constrain. And we had it, uh, was able to rotate it and nothing moved or broke apart. So um, this was a fairly straightforward design. Um, some, some things that we did uh, see when we got our first uh, dimension sheets where there were comments uh, about um, all the uh, fillets and chamfers uh, were about one millimeter or 0.1 millimeters, which was not accurate at all. Um, there were a lot of uh, extra dimensions that uh, weren't even uh, included in the sheets that we kind of had to just improvise and then look at the the displayed of the th uh, displays of the three uh, dimensional and then the orthogonal views just to infer exactly what uh, sizes of radiuses, exactly um, what uh, kind of attachments we were looking at. Some inner dimensions for uh, holes weren't included, and so we just had to use um, our best engineering judgment uh, to figure it out. But like I said, everything kind of came together very easily.